started. Uh, so it's our pleasure to have Clayton Schockweiler here from Colorado State University, who's going to be speaking to us about the symplectic geometry of polygon space and how to use it. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, many of you have been to now three of my talks. <laughs> so that's, that's showing a, a hell of a lot of patience with me. So I, I really actually do appreciate that a lot. Um, so all right, so the, uh, the title is sort of fairly s explanatory of what I want to do. I want to talk about polygons. I want to talk about symplectic geometry. I want to talk about how the two come together. And I also want to talk about connections to polymer physics. Um, so many of you were at my talk yesterday where I described a model for closed, relatively framed polygons in R3, where you fix the total length, um, but otherwise don't have any sort of control over the edge lengths. And the, um, the basic object, the moduli space of these things, was the Grossmannian of two planes in CN. Um, and if you weren't in my talk yesterday, um, it's not so important to exactly how this works, just to say that there is some sort of connection between a certain class of polygons, just meaning you have these piecewise linear embeddings of the circle into R3, and there's this connection with um, the Grossmannian of two planes in CN. Um, and so, like I said, that model didn't really have any restrictions on the edge lengths, other than that the total length of the thing was equal to two. Um, and it also includes this framing information, which is maybe physically meaningful and maybe not. Um, so you could ask, well, what if you don't care about the frames, but you do care about the edge lengths? And so in particular, people are very interested in the situation where all the edge lengths are equal to each other. So so-called equilateral polygons. Um, and this is a totally heuristic and completely false picture of the Grossmannian. Um, but so it goes, right? Um, so you have sort of different strata that are, or strata is probably the wrong word, but you certainly have different submanifolds that are determined by different choices of links of the edge lengths. So like up here, you know, you can have a situation where one of the edges has length one, but since the total length is supposed to be two, that means, you know, you jumped out one and you spend all your time just coming back on that same line. So the polygon is sort of a, lies on a line. Um, as you would expect, the volume of the space of those things is equal to zero. Um, in these different situations, you have different sort of prescribed edge lengths, and it turns out to be a theorem that the equilateral polygons are sort of the biggest volume space among these different sort of spaces. Um, uh oh. No problem. <laughs> Oops. OK, so um, the basic idea is that somehow this Grossmannian is sort of an assembly of these spaces where you fix the edge lengths in advance. Um, and so um, the motivation for all of this comes from polymer physics because these, these you know, closed random walks or random polygons are sort of a very idealized model of ring polymers. Um, so th this is a slide that you saw if you went to my talk yesterday. Um, this is sort of the first example of knotted DNA that was discovered. Um, that's a simulation of a DNA mini circle um, from this group in the UK. And the basic idea is to, okay, the, the basic sort of ideal gas law, you know, as the ideal gas law is to actual gases, you know, this, you know, random walk model is to actual polymers. Um, so the idea is, okay, you, you want to model polymer by a random walk. If you have a ring polymer, you want to model it by a random walk that's constrained to close up after exactly n steps. Um, okay, so I want to talk about how the moduli spaces of these fixed edge length polygons fit into sort of the symplectic geometry world, um, and then how to actually use the symplectic geometry to do interesting things. And then um, one of the really interesting things that you can do with this, with this whole machinery is to come up with really good sampling algorithms. Um, so if you are a polymer physicist, 
or an applied mathematician who's interested in these random walk problems, um, one thing you want to do is, well, we have behavior, like we want to understand the scaling behavior of these things as n goes to infinity. Or we want to get some sense of like how many you know, different knots do you see when you have 1,023 edges or something like that. Things about which you can't really prove theorems, but you can, of course, do Monte Carlo integration if you know how to draw samples from the space. Um, and so it's, it's very important to have very fast algorithms for sampling these spaces. Um, okay, so here's the setup. First off, just classic random walk. You pick a starting point, you choose a direction uniformly on the sphere of possible directions, you take a unit step in that direction, you're at, now you're at a new point, you choose a direction uniformly on the sphere of possible directions, you take a unit step in that direction and just iterate. So, okay, if you mod out by translations, by say picking the first point to be at the origin, um, then you might as well treat these edges as vectors, just they're unit vectors, so they're points on the two sphere. So what you're looking at is a product of two spheres. And then if you don't want to take unit steps, you want to take steps of, you know, the first step of length R1 and the second step of length R2 and so on and so forth, you get these spheres of different radii. Um, so this is what I'm calling the arm space is, or other, just a classical random walk space, which is a product of two spheres, which is a, you know, perfectly nice space, um, very easy to understand. Slightly harder to understand is, okay, well, if you now have this condition that you get back to the starting point, you know, at the end, well, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, well, first vector, second vector, third vector, get back to the starting point. That's just saying the vector sum of the edges is equal to the zero vector. Um, now, notice that this is really a co-dimension three condition because this is a vector equation and you have three coordinates. So really you're saying that three different numbers are equal to zero. So this is a co-dimension three condition, which in particular tells you you can't do something stupid like rejection sample these guys to get these guys because it's, you know, it's probability zero. And in fact, it's like really zero because it's positive co-dimension. Uh, here, so here's an example of a six step random walk that forms a trefoil knot. Okay. So the idea is to use some of the special geometry of this product of two spheres to your advantage. Um, and it turns out that the appropriate geometry is the symplectic structure that this thing naturally has, right? So this is a surface, it has an area, it's an oriented surface, it has an area form. This is a product of, you know, surfaces. So it has, you know, the, the symplectic form is just the sum of the area forms on each factor, possibly normalized, um, depending on, on what you do. Um, so this is a symplectic manifold. Um, and you're now thinking of this as your random walk space. So you have a random walk. If you rotate it in space, that's just an SO3 action on the space that it's sitting in. And if you're just interested in the shapes of these things, you don't care so much about the particular orientation, so maybe you want to divide by this SO3 action. Okay, well, the SO3 acting on the walk is just the diagonal SO3 acting on this product of spheres, um, which certainly is area preserving on each factor, so it's a symplectomorphism of this symplectic manifold. Okay. Um, it turns out to not just be a symplectomorphism, but a Hamiltonian action of this SO3. Um, and so I'll, I'll say a little bit more about you know, Hamiltonian actions and moment maps and so on and so forth in a minute. But um, whenever you have a, have a Hamiltonian action, you have a corresponding moment map. Um, and sort of the slogan is that the moment map records the conserved quantities of the action. Um, and in this case, if you do the computation, you see that the moment map from here to R3 just gives you the sum of the vectors. So you have n vectors on the sphere, you take the sum, that's what the moment map is. And so in particular, if you care about the guys that close up, you're, you care about the guys which map to zero, the zero vector, under this moment map. So your polygon space is the inverse image of zero. And if you take the inverse image of zero under the moment map, you divide by the SO3 action, 
you're getting the space of polygons mod translation because you took edge vectors and rotation because you just divided by SO3. So that's the space that you really care about. And this construction over here turns out to be something called the symplectic reduction. So this is, in fact, the symplectic reduction of the product of two spheres by the SO, this Hamiltonian SO3 action. OK, so then what I just described is this right here. You have this product of two spheres. You symplectically reduce by the SO3. You get this polygon space. Um, now this, as you can see, fits into a bigger diagram. So you can see the product of S2s as a symplectic reduction of C2 to the N by just the diagonal complex N by N matrices. Um, this is a, just a standard construction. Um, so you, you reduce by this torus, then you reduce by this SO3, and you can kind of go the other way around. So SO3 is, um, well, U2 is a circle bundle over SO3, and if you take the reduction of this C2N by the U2, you get the Grassmannian of two planes in CN, and this is the story that I told yesterday. These, this two planes in CN exactly correspond to these closed polygons where the total length is fixed, but the edge lengths are allowed to vary. Um, and then the point is, well, you can reduce this by this torus, and you get back to the same space as before. Um, so I'm, I'm just focusing on this part of the diagram in this talk, but I just want to say, like, this is a picture that, you know, fit, I mean, this, this story that I'm telling today fits into this larger picture. And in fact, there's an algebraic geometry analog of the same picture. If you replace symplectic reduction by geometric invariant theory quotient, it, you get more or less the same picture. You have to divide by algebraic groups instead of compact groups, but it's basically the same thing. Um, OK, so now let me give a few details. Um, I know many of you know things about symplectic manifolds, but I suspect some of you don't. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words. So what's a symplectic manifold? Well, it's an even dimensional manifold. And you have this special two form called the symplectic form, which is closed and non-degenerate. Um, and the fact that it's non-degenerate, I mean, non-degenerate is equivalent to saying that if you take the, you know, you wedge it with itself n times, you get a form that never vanishes. So you took n wedges of a two form on a 2n manifold, this is a top dimensional form that never vanishes. It's a volume form, so you have a natural volume form on any symplectic manifold. OK. Now, that's a symplectic manifold. What about these actions by groups, these Hamiltonian actions? So if you have, a, first off, just a circle action, um, then in general, like you have a group action, if it preserves the symplectic structure, you say it acts by symplectomorphisms. Um, now, of course, if you have your circle action, you can just look at the tangent vectors to the circle action, and that gives you a vector field on the manifold. Um, now, you have a vector field and a two form, and of course, if you have a vector field and a two form, you can get a one form just by contracting the vector field into the form. So this gives you sort of a natural one form whenever you have a vector field on the symplectic manifold. And then the point is, OK, well, now this is a one form. If it's exact, then it's d of a zero form, which is to say d of a function. And that function is called a Hamiltonian for this action, and the action is called Hamiltonian. It, uh, it's Hamiltonian or moment map or momentum map or whatever you want. Um, so again, the, um, the slogan is that this moment map records the conserved quantities of your Hamiltonian circle action. Um, OK. Well, now, if instead of a circle, you have a product of circles, it's obvious how to generalize this. You just say, well, each circle individually you know, acts in a Hamiltonian fashion. And so you get now, if you have k circles, you have now k moment maps, which you can package together into a single map to Rk. And the coordinates of this moment map record the conserved quantities of your k, you know, circle actions. OK, and then you have two super awesome theorems in this situation. So the first is that the image of the moment map is a convex polytope. 
And in fact, you know exactly what this convex polytope is. The vertices, it's the, so it, well, what should I say? It's the, um, it's the convex hull of the images of the fixed points of the, of the torus action. So you have this torus action, you may have some fixed points. If you look at the images of the fixed points on the moment map and take the convex hull of all of them, you get exactly this polytope. So it's, it's not just a convex polytope, it's a well understood convex polytope if you understand the action of the group. Um, and then the other awesome thing is if you take this volume form given to you by the symplectic form, that induces a measure on the manifold called the Liouville measure or the symplectic measure, just by saying, well, the measure of a subset is just integrate this volume form over the subset. And now measures push forward. So if you push forward that measure on your manifold down to the moment polytope, which sits inside of Euclidean space, you get some measure on this convex polytope. Um, and so the kind of amazing thing is that in general, it's a piecewise polynomial multiple of Lebesgue measure. So Lebesgue measure just being the uniform measure on this convex polytope. Um, and the degree of the piecewise polynomial is related to the dimension of the torus. And in particular, if the dimension of the torus is half the dimension of the manifold, then this polynomial is degree zero and so your measure is just the uniform measure on this convex polytope. At least it's the probability measure. You have a factor of two pi to the whatever to account for the sort of the circles. Um, but if you're doing probability measures, then this really is just the same thing. Okay, so that was kind of intense, probably. Um, so here's kind of a down to the earth example. So a uh, symplectic manifold, you need an even dimensional manifold with a closed non degenerate two form. And of course, the two sphere is like the nicest possible example of such a thing, right? So you have the round two sphere, it has the standard area form. That's a symplectic manifold, it's certainly closed, it's certainly non degenerate. Um, and we can act by rotating around the z axis. Now, certainly, rotating the sphere around an axis preserves area. So it's a symplectomorphism. And in fact, it turns out to be Hamiltonian. Um, and if you think in terms of the slogan, what's the moment map of a Hamiltonian action? It records the conserved quantities. What are the conserved quantities? Well, there's only one because there's only one circle acting. And it has to be the z coordinate of the point on the sphere. I mean, in, in general, if you're rotating around some axis, it's the dot product of the point with that axis, right? Um, and so in this case, well, it's just the map records the z coordinate. So the image is the interval minus 1, 1, which is indeed convex. And then you have this theorem. So Deussemann Heckmann tells you that the push forward measure is just, you know, a constant multiple of Lebesgue measure on the interval. And of course, this fact was already known to Archimedes. Right? And, and this, is a, uh, this is, in fact, a theorem that a Calc 2 student can do. You just need to know, okay, well, if you integrate, if you compute the area of this strip of the sphere contained between two horizontal planes, then its area is just 2 pi times the difference in height between the two planes. And so it's 2 pi times the length of the image interval. So indeed, the push forward measure is 2 pi times the Lebesgue measure. Okay. And in fact, this gives you something slightly more. If you think about this in terms of measure theory or sort of probability, you can now go the other way. You say, OK, well, if I take a point on the interval from minus 1 to 1 and think of that as my z coordinate, and then if I take an angle, theta, which sits on the unit circle, then I have a map from z comma theta to the sphere by just thinking of these as cylindrical coordinates on the sphere. So this, this is just the trig you have to do to recover the Cartesian coordinates of the point on the sphere with these as its cylindrical coordinates. Um, but then the theorem that we just proved says that, or didn't really prove, but stated at least, um, <laughs> says that this map, this map from this, the cylinder to the sphere, is measure preserving. Um, and so in particular, like if you wanted to generate points uniformly on the sphere, you could just generate points uniformly on the cylinder, which is easy because you're generating points uniformly from minus 1 to 1 and uniformly from 0 to 2 pi, and then applying this map, and you're guaranteed to get points that are uniformly distributed on the sphere. Um, 
And so this, this toric structure, this sort of giant torus of symmetries, gives you almost global coordinates on the sphere. Something crazy is happening at the north and the south pole, but those are, you know, positive co-dimension subsets, and so if you're trying to do Monte Carlo integration and your functions are sufficiently continuous or something, then you don't really care about these positive co-dimension pieces. Um, so um, this, this is basically what we want to generalize to the setting of equilateral polygons. Um, okay, so I also mentioned symplectic reduction. And let me not really say exactly what's on this slide. Let me just say that, okay, you have a symplectic manifold, you have a Hamiltonian group action, you want to take the quotient of the manifold by the action and get a new symplectic manifold. Like, this should be what you get because Hamiltonian is sort of the appropriate notion of a, of a, of a legitimate group action in the symplectic category. Of course, it turns out it doesn't quite work because what if your group is odd dimensional? You have your even dimensional manifold, you divide by an odd dimensional group, you get an odd dimensional manifold, it cannot possibly be symplectic. Um, so it turns out the right thing to do is to do this thing called symplectic reduction, where you take the fiber over a, uh, over a point in the moment polytope and you divide that by the action of the group and the resulting space gets a, a symplectic structure that's induced by the symplectic structure upstairs. So this double slash here means you, you're symplectically reducing over a particular choice of point in the moment polytope. Um, and it has to be the case that the group actually preserves the fiber. If it doesn't preserve the fiber, of course, this makes no sense. Um, okay, so again, I just repeat this picture. So this is, notice I didn't make these things arrows because you don't really have maps here, right? You don't have a, an actual quotient map in the symplectic reduction story. Um, but this is a symplectic reduction of this, and this is a symplectic reduction of this, and this is a symplectic reduction in two different ways like this. Okay, so that's what gives you the symplectic structure on the space of polygons of fixed edge length. Um, and let me just say briefly that this torus is basically what kills off the framing information that came from your Grossman. Grossmannian. Um, if you weren't at my talk yesterday, that means nothing to you, but that's okay. Um, all right, so, oh, you know what? I opened this in the wrong thing. All right, let me open this. Uh, And this is, okay, so fine. So that gives you a symplectic structure on the space of polygons. And now I claim that in fact the space of polygons has a toric structure as well. Um, and so now let me describe that to you. So the idea is, okay, I have my n-gon with prescribed edge lengths. And now just think of this purely abstractly, so you might as well take the sort of planar convex one because it doesn't matter. Now pick your favorite triangulation of your planar convex end gun. So triangulation just meaning you connect up vertex to vertex with, um, with a line segment so that then you've chopped up the interior of this convex polygon into a collection of triangles. Um, and of course, in order to do that, the, these line segments aren't allowed to intersect. Um, and what are some facts? Well, one, the number of ways to do this is the n minus second Catalan number. Um, and when you choose a particular triangulation, you have n minus three of these segments and you have n minus two triangles. Okay, so now what you're gonna do is you say, okay, well, take this segment. Well, actually, let me show you the video first because it will be more self-explanatory if I can get it to play. Oh, come on. There we go. So what you do is you take each of these segments, you treat it as an axis, and you fix one part of the polygon and you rotate the other part around that axis. So here I'm fixing the first two edges 
and I'm rotating the rest of it around that axis. And when I'm doing the, the next one, I'm fixing the first three edges and rotating the other ones around that axis and so on and so forth. So let me just show you this, this picture again. Um, and so the point is, well, you can choose how much you rotate around each of these n minus three axes independently. So this is an n minus three dimensional torus action on your manifold. Um, and the fact that these cores don't intersect means that these actions commute, so it's really actually honestly a torus action. Um, okay. So the action turns out to be Hamiltonian. This is not so surprising because if, as you were watching the video, notice that the distance between this vertex and that vertex or this vertex and that vertex and so on didn't change. You have conserved quantities. Those conserved quantities are those chord lengths, the lengths of these line segments that you introduced in your triangulation. Um, so those are the conserved quantities. So the moment map just records the lengths of those segments. Okay, so let's see what that looks. So the, the moral of the story then is that the moment polytope is just the, you know, given by the images of the links of those chord links over all possible, you know, embeddings of your abstract triangulation or um, uh, polygon into three space. Now, what are the constraints? There have to be constraints, right? Well, of course, so looking at this five gon, you have two chord links because it's n minus three, d1 and d2. And well, D1 sits in two different triangles. And so it has to obey two different sets of triangle inequalities. Um, and so D1 certainly has to be greater than or equal to zero if you bring this vertex to that vertex. And it has to be less than or equal to two if you imagine flattening out the triangle because the lengths of these two sides, let's say, is, oh, I should, didn't say this, but I should have said this. Um, I guess in this example, I'm saying that all of the edge lengths are equal to one. In general, it would be, you know, D1 is less than or equal to R1 plus R2. Um, but in this example, if R1 and R2 and R3, R4, R5 are all equal to one, then I'm saying, well, D1 has to be less than or equal to two. Likewise, D2 has to be less than or equal to two. Um, and then on this triangle in the middle, you get the other three triangle inequalities. And so the moment polytope for this two-dimensional torus action on this space of pentagons is exactly this funny looking pentagon here. Okay, if you do the same story for the hexagon with this triangulation, you get this um, three-dimensional polyhedron with five vertices. So one, two, three, four, and five all, you know, I say what the coordinates there are. Okay, so fine. What we have so far is a map from the space of n-gons to this weird polytope determined by triangle inequalities. Um, but just like before, we had the sphere, you had this map to the interval that recorded the z-coordinate, you can go the other way. So we, had, we said, okay, we can turn around the, the, the sphere story and take a map from the cylinder to the sphere. Well, likewise here, you can take a map from the moment polytope which was like the interval minus one, one in the cylinder story, cross this torus, which is like the circle factor in the cylinder. Um, and how does this map work? Well, so if I pick a point in the moment polytope, I'm choosing chord lengths, in this case, D1 and D2. And okay, well, I've already fixed the lengths of the other edges, of the edges in my polygon to be the Rs. So if I know the length of the first side and the second side, and I know D1, I know this triangle because side, side, side determines a triangle. And if I know D1 and D2 and this side length, I know that triangle and so on and so forth. So just knowing the point in the moment polytope uniquely determines this collection of triangles. And you know how to glue them together because of course D1, the, this side of length D1 gets glued to this side of length D1. And now these, these coordinates on the torus tell you the dihedral angle with which you glue these things together. So you have these two triangles, you glue them together, and then you bend by some angle theta one, and likewise for the theta two, and if you had more, you know, theta three, theta four, and so on and so forth. Um, so that gives you then this shape, and then you just get rid of the little surface, the piecewise linear surface, and what you're left with is your five gon or your n gon or whatever. 
Um, and notice in particular that like you would know nothing about the orientation of this thing in space, so it makes sense that you had to divide by SO3 to get your polygon space here. Um, because you know, this thing, or if you rotated it you know, around some axis, it would know no difference as far as these coordinates are concerned. Okay, so the theorem, which is really just a souped up version of this theorem about cylindrical coordinates on the sphere, is that this map from moment polytope cross torus to polygon space pushes forward the standard, just the product measure here. So you have a Lebesgue measure on this factor. You have just the, the product measure on this product of circles pushes forward to the correct probability measure on this space, which is like super cool. Um, and so in particular, what this tells you is if you know how to sample this moment polytope, this weird polytope determined by these triangle inequalities, you know how to sample this space because, of course, it's easy to sample the torus. And it, you can do this reconstruction map that I showed in the previous slide. Um, so if you have a sampling algorithm for the moment polytope, you have a sampling algorithm for polygons, period. Um, you can also... So I'll come back to that statement in a minute, but let me also give some theoretical consequences of this theorem. So the first of which being, okay, well, consider this triangulation I showed before where you connect all the vertices to, say, the first vertex. Well, then, if you want to know the average vertex-vertex distance from the first vertex to the, you know, kth vertex, well, that's just the length of that cord connecting the first vertex to the 17th vertex. But that's just a coordinate of the moment map, which is to say the average of it is going to be the average of the appropriate coordinate of the moment polytope. So all you have to do to compute expected values is find the center of mass of the moment polytope, which is not so hard. Um, so I just show you sort of a table of various values you can get. So this is saying if you have a quadrilateral and you connect the first vertex to the third vertex, then the average value of that distance is equal to one. Um, and if you wanted like the variance, you would take the second center of mass of the polytope. Or if you want, you know, the kth moment, you would take the kth, or I shouldn't say k, the pth moment, you would take the pth center of mass of the moment polytope. Um, so you're turning these questions about expected vertex-vertex distances, which are really important in the polymer world because they want to know what's the size of the molecule. Well, well, one way of measuring the size is just to measure the diameter, which is sort of the largest of these vertex-vertex distances. And so they are really, really interested in these vertex-vertex distances. Um, and let me just say, like, okay, these are small values, but you can also do big values. So here I have 112 gone, and I'm taking the cord that connects the first vertex to the 38th vertex, I think. Um, so I'm skipping 37 edges. So this is some rational number. This is a 205-digit integer in, in the numerator and a 204-digit integer in the denominator. Um, and so in particular, like the fact that it's, you know, coordinates of the center of mass, and it turns out that all of the, if, if for example, you take equilateral guys where all of the, the side lengths are equal to one, then all of the uh, vertices of the moment polytope have to be at integer points. And so in particular, the center of mass has to be, have rational coordinates, which is like totally not obvious just from looking at this, that all of these expected values, and in fact, all of the moments of these quantities should be rational numbers. That's kind of weird and surprising. <clears throat> um, another thing that you can do is you can use these coordinates to prove this theorem, which says at least half the space of equilateral hexagons is unknots. Um, and this is um, not a computation I want to show you, but it, you know, it's kind of a, a, a cool geometric fact. Um, it basically, it, it corresponds to the fact that you know that if you, if you have a hexagon that forms a trefoil knot, then all of these dihedral angles have to either be between 0 and pi or between pi and 2 pi. So they are all you know, 0 to pi or all pi to 2 pi, and that's like 1 eighth of the total torus of possible dihedral angles, and then you do some analysis. Um, so that's a lower bound on the probability of being an unknot. But if you now do some numerical experiments, you see that it's a really crappy lower bound, like really, really crappy, um, because in fact, it's about, you know, one in 10,000 of these things is not the unknot. Um, 
but it is a lower bound, and it's the only lower bound that anybody knows. Um, but of course, what you should ask is like, well, how, I mean, this is a pretty precise statement. With 95% confidence between 1.1 and 1.5 out of 10,000 are, are uh, not it. Um, and the only way we can be so precise is to give like a really rock solid sampling algorithm with really good error, you know, ways of computing error bars. Um, so here's how that goes. Well, so first let me say um, why this is non-trivial. Um, so people have been doing sampling algorithms for equilateral polygons for a long time. Um, mostly what people use are these Markov chain algorithms. Um, more recently, people have introduced various other methods. Um, and the point of this slide is to say that there are problems with all of these existing algorithms. Um, in particular, the Markov chain algorithms, it's not known, it's not actually been proved that they converge to anything, um, let alone to the correct thing. Um, Everybody believes that they do. So I, I, I'm not claiming that these actually don't converge. I'm just saying that nobody actually knows whether they do or not, but everybody kind of believes that they do. Um, and then these direct sampling algorithms, well, this is sampling some discrete subset of this manifold, so that, and it's totally unknown like whether that discrete subset sort of covers the space uniformly or whether it's sort of not, doesn't cover it uniformly. Um, this, it's not so clear what's going on. This. It works, but it's computationally disgusting and horrible. Um, you have to use like rational arithmetic, and you're, 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 you have the, you're sampling these densities, um, these distributions whose densities are like these weird polynomials. And if you try to write down the polynomials, say for n equals 100, you get like a 50 megabyte text file, and it's just really um, not, not numerically very tractable. Um, Okay, but I claim that there's a better way, and the better way is to just sample this moment polytope. So here's the idea. Um, so first off, I'm just gonna focus on this particular choice of triangulation for each end where I connect all the vertices to the first vertex. Again, there's a Catalan number worth of different triangulations you could choose, and it may well be the case that different triangulations are much better actually than this one but this is the one where I know what everything is. Um, and so again, these are just the triangle inequalities you get when you just write down all of the triangle inequalities. You're saying, well, the first D1 is between zero and two, the, D, the last one is between zero and two, and the rest of them have to satisfy the triangle inequalities that are kind of obvious. You know, this plus this has to be bigger than this, this plus this has to be bigger than this, and this plus this has to be bigger than this. So those are the, the three that you see in the middle. Okay. Um, now you do a change. So this, these are kind of weird, these inequalities. And the, the polytopes you get are kind of weird and asymmetric. Um, so, but notice that in particular, like the, dis, the difference between consecutive chord lengths is always between minus one and one. Um, and so this kind of tells you, well, maybe it would be a good idea to change coordinates and let your new coordinates be these sort of consecutive differences. Um, because then you know that your new coordinates are always in the, the cube between minus one and one, rather than in, it's like here, you can, you can go out to like n over two in general in certain directions, but in other directions, you can only go out to two. Um, so we introduce this change of coordinates where we just choose S's to be these, you know, consecutive differences of the Ds. Um, and so if you take the sum of all of the S's, you're getting a telescoping sum in the Ds. And so in particular, what you get is you get the last one minus the first one. Um, and I forgot to say you introduce these fake chord lengths where D0 is one and Dn minus two is one. Um, which makes sense because you sort of think of D0 as the length of the first edge and Dn minus two is the length of the last edge and those are both one. Um, so when you do that, the sum of the S size is equal to zero. So the, the last one of course is determined by the, all the other ones. Um, so these, these inequalities that I had before become these inequalities here. 
So the difference of the d's are just the s's, so that's telling you the s's are between minus 1 and 1. The sum of the s sizes between minus 1 and 1 is just saying, well, if you took all of them, you get 0. If you take all but one of them, you just get minus the last one, which of course has to be between minus 1 and 1. Um, and then it turns out that this inequality here, that 1 is less than or equal to the sum of two consecutive guys, is a little bit weird. You get these, um, this slightly odd looking inequality here. So you're taking sort of, these are the partial sums of the s's and these are the partial sums with one more of them. And that has to be bounded below by minus one. Um, okay, so let me just show you what that looks like. So if I take those inequalities I had bef before for n equals five, I get this green thing here. Right? So certainly, you know, you're between minus 1 and 1. Um, and then that, that last inequality here basically says, well, 2s1 plus s2 has to be bigger than or equal to minus 1. And that gives you this line right there. Um, if you do it for n equals 6, you get this, again, slightly odd looking thing inside of the cube. OK. So that's what our moment polytope looks like after we do this change of coordinates. Now we're trying to sample this moment polytope and it turns out, and it took me over a year to realize this, that you can sample this thing doing the dumbest possible thing. All you have to do is sample points uniformly on the cube and throw away the ones that don't satisfy the inequalities you care about and that is actually fast. So here's the theorem that makes it all work. I mean, it's amazing, but it's true. Um, here's the theorem that makes it all work. You, you want points in the green thing. Well, then if you're just rejection sampling the entire cube, the, the acceptance ratio is just given by the volume ratio of the green thing to the whole cube. Well, of course, you know the volume of the cube. It's 2 to the whatever number of dimensions you have, which in this case is n minus 3. So if you can figure out the volume of the green thing, you're done. OK, well, the volume of the green thing turns out asymptotically to be this. Um, oh, no, it's not this. This is, this is, I've already done the volume ratio. So the probability that a point in the cube lies in the green thing is exactly this. And notice that, okay, you have some constants, but all you have to care about is the 1 over n to the 3 halves, which is pretty good, right? I mean, this, the, the volume ratio is pretty big. Um, so this is going to tell you if you sample points uniformly in the cube, you know, with probability 1 over n to the 3 halves, you've chosen a point in the green thing. And so you're, it takes, you know, however long it takes to sample points in the cube times n to the 3 halves to sample points in, in the green polytope. Um, and if you spend a year trying to figure this out, you can come up with a pretty slick proof, although it may be completely non-obvious if you haven't spent that year. Um, OK, so first off, OK, what we care about now is the volume ratio of the green polytope to the cube. And again, we know the volume of the cube. Here is the volume of the green polytope, explicitly written down. Um, this is not a nice expression. Like The fact that you have this alternating term here is really bad numerically. Like, and doing asymptotics with this is also equally unpleasant. Um, so you have like all kinds of almost cancellations and trying to evaluate this is really nasty. Um, but, oops, I went the wrong way. Here's an observation which um, actually appears in Edward's book on the integral calculus and something or other and its applications from 1922. Basically, this is a book containing lots of crazy, you know, integrals. Um, like, it's like an early version of Gradstein and Rizik or something, right? Um, which says that if you evaluate this integral, you get this alternating sum. Well, he did it in more generality. You take x to the whatever power you want in the denominator and you get some slightly more complicated expression. But um, this alternating sum is equal to this Dirichlet type integral. Um, 
Okay. So we're just going to take that on. It's actually easy to prove, but we're just going to take this on faith. Um, then how do you get the asymptotics for the volume? Well, you do this. So first off, you make this substitution in this expression here. You substitute y over root n in for x. So I've done that here. And then you say, OK, well, when you write down the Taylor series for this sine of y over root n divided by y over root n, the first two terms of that Taylor series are the same as the first two terms of this e to the minus y squared over 6n Taylor series. OK, but that's awesome, because now the over 6n and the 2 to the 6n go away, and you're just left with this integral, which you can now evaluate using Mathematica if you're lazy. And you get this number here. And then, therefore, the volume ratio is this number divided by 2 to the n over n minus 3, which is exactly the number that I promised before. Um, this really annoyed me when I eventually came across it, because we had much scarier and more disgusting ways of doing this that were also worse. Um, the, the first version of this algorithm was cubic time instead of, you know, or quadratic time instead of into the three halves time. Um, and it involved, you know, sampling permutations of n letters with exactly k descents using a weird recursive algorithm. And it was, and you had to store a bunch of like recursion probabilities and memory, and it was really gross. Um, so this is way nicer, because you're doing the dumbest possible thing. You're generating points uniformly on the hypercube. OK, that takes linear time. Easy. You test whether those guys satisfy your linear inequality, your finite list of linear inequalities. Uh, we just said, well, the acceptance ratio is 1 over n to the 3 halves. And then you just change coordinates from s's to d's. You generate dihedral angles uniformly on the torus. And then you say, OK, well, now I have points on the whole polytope. I have points on the torus. I reconstruct in the way that I showed you before. So all of these, well, this step is constant time. Or no, sorry, linear time. These two steps are linear time. So the important thing is it's O of n times O of n to the 3 halves. So the whole thing is O of n to the 5 halves. Um, which is cool. And so you can do, this is, this is a slightly weird experiment. Um, so what we did was we generated 10 million 60 gons. And we computed the Homfley polynomial for all 10 million of these 60 gons. And you get, OK, well, so 42 of these 10 million were numerically singular, meaning like up to numerical error, two of the vertices coincided or something like that. Um, and so the Homfley calculator completely died. We didn't care so much, so we just threw those 42 away. But of the remaining you know, 10 million minus 42, we saw 6,371 distinct Homfley polynomials. Um, so you know, greater than or equal to this many different not types, of course, right? Um, and then what this plot is showing you, which is sort of not so obvious, is we sorted these 6,371 distinct Homfleys according to their frequency. And of course, the most frequent was the Homfley for the unknot, right? And that's this. And then so we sorted them by their frequency. So that's this axis down here. And then we plotted their, um, their probability. And that's what this axis is here. And this is a log-log plot. Um, so that's the unknot. These are the left-handed and right-handed trefoils. That's the figure eight. Um, Oh, shoot. I think these are the, the two five twos, maybe? I've now forgotten what all these things are. Um, you have the five twos, you have five one, you have um, one of, so granny knot and square knot are in there somewhere. Like, anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, oh, for sure, absolutely. Um, and in fact, probably most of these are composite. Yeah, yeah. Um, or certainly many, well, no, not most of them, uh, but certainly lots of them. Yeah, so yeah, the statement was, oh, so you ha allow composite ones. And yes, there, you definitely see lots and lots of composite knots, for sure. Um, and we chopped it off at 1,000. So of course, this would flatten out, because most of these just appeared like once. Um, 
So, but that's not so interesting. Um, and then you look at this and you say, well, that looks like a straight line. And then you find the line of best fit and it's something gross. But you stare at the line of best fit for like five minutes and you go, well, it's awfully similar to this. So I just, this is statistically completely meaningless. I'm not claiming that anything is going on here. I'm just saying like, if you plot this function on this graph, you get this line. Whether this is actually evidence of power law behavior or anything, I am making no claims about whatsoever. Um, I'm just saying that when you plot the frequencies and when you plot that function, you get that picture. Um, but it would be really cool if you could prove something about this, um, in my opinion. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'm pretty much done. So let me just briefly mention like what are some remaining questions you could ask? And the answer is almost everything you, is unknown. Um, so first off, I showed this picture before of symplectic reductions and I said, well, there's a corresponding picture using projective varieties and geometric invariant theory quotients. So this is the same picture, but now in the algebraic geometry language. And um, as far as I know, nobody has used the algebraic geometry in some essential way to say anything about random polygons. But it's my very strong conviction that there are powerful results one could prove about random polygons by using well-known facts from algebraic geometry. Um, so I would encourage anybody who has any intuition about algebraic geometry to either contact me or just start proving theorems for yourself. Um, Another really important question if you want to actually model physical polymers is, okay, well, physical polymers, like, you have excluded volume constraints. Like, your actual polymer can't self-intersect. Like, in fact, you know, the, if the core curves of your polymer have to stay, you know, some distance epsilon away from each other. How can you incorporate those excluded volume constraints into this model to make it more physically realistic? Um, and these excluded volume constraints are sort of algebraic inequalities. So again, I feel like, you know, the algebraic geometry should be sort of a fundamental tool for this kind of a problem. Um, because, like, if you take the, the, the things that satisfy these excluded volume constraints, they're like semi-algebraic sets or something. Um, so you should be able to, to do something interesting. Um, Another question, which I, I, I talked about yesterday as well, is, okay, well, this was just for loops. What about more complicated graphs? So this is a synthetic um, complete bipartite graph on three letters and three letters, um, just synthesized within the last year or two in Tokyo. Um, so, okay, what's the corresponding moduli space of K33s or Peterson graphs or theta curves or, you know, pick your favorite graph that you want to realize as a polymer and come up with the moduli space of random walks that realize that graph. Um, and what about bumping up the dimension? So one way of saying what I've said is, well, these are the moduli space of piecewise linear immersions of the circle into R3, where you have a fixed number of edges and each edge is a fixed length. What about piecewise linear immersions of surfaces into R3 or R4 or R whatever, or more generally piecewise linear K-manifolds, maybe with certain constraints on the areas of the faces or whatever? Like, presumably there's, well, I would, I would like to believe that there's some sort of generalization of this whole story to that situation. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you very much for, for coming. Does anyone have any questions? How did you come across that integral computation? <laughs> so the question is, how did I come across this integral computation? Um, the answer is um, one of my co-authors, uh, let me show you his name, Bertrand Duplantier, um, did some sort of weird Fourier integral calculation and just actually computed the integral. And then I said, you know what, this has got to be known. Like, you're just doing weird Fourier analysis tricks. Like, it must be, I mean, basically, the, 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 
Yeah. Like, once you know that this can be expressed in an integral like this, you then just go looking for this integral in the literature until you find it, right? Um, but yeah, it was, it was Bertrand's genius idea that this would actually be what it was. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so the, the question for the, the audio is, um, this all depends on the choice of triangulation, and what, what is that, you know, what does the triangulation mean in this story? And so the, the, um, the short answer is that, um, so the theorem works, this theorem works for any triangulation, whatever your favorite triangulation is, this theorem is true. Um, and so then, in principle, what you should do is you should pick, so what the triangulation is determines what this polytope is, what this triangle inequality polytope is. And then in principle, what you should do is you should pick the triangulation with the best polytope and, you know, sample that polytope and then do the whole story. Um, I suspect this one that we picked is not the best polytope. It was just sort of algebraically very simple and we sort of... Well, I mean, so... The, the best polytope would be one where you had a unimodular triangulation that was indexed in a very simple way. And then therefore you could A, do sampling, because once you have a unimodular triangulation, tr sampling is trivial, um, and B, you could prove theorems because you, you understood this particularly well. Um, so that's, it's not a well-defined best, but that's what I mean by best. Well, if you don't have any more questions, let's thank you again. Thank you.